Welcome to this Youth Research Dialogue. This is our third episode of our thematic online series of evidence-based youth research findings. My name is Carmen Teubel. I'm the project manager and coordinator for the European Youth Research Network, RAE, which is hosted here at the Finnish National Agency for Education. Uh, at the moment, we have 32 uh, partners in 34 European countries. A partner is always a national agency of the European youth programs, as well as a national research partner. And yeah, these partners jointly contribute um, to the monitoring and um, conducting research on the impact of the European youth programs. But the aim is also to look a little bit beyond this. And also the aim is to um, dive deeper with some topics and conduct thematic research projects. So since 2008, uh, Ray conducted research which explores uh, the effects of participation and citizenship, for example, as part of its monitoring service, but also um, a two thematic research project, which dealt, for example, with long term effects or quite recently uh, research projects um, on methods and approaches, approaches which foster participation and citizenship education and learning. And with this youth research dialogue, we wanted not only to um, present and discuss our array research findings on these topics, which will be done today by Helmut Fennes. Um, he is a member of our array, um, transnational research team. But we always also wanted to take a, a deeper look or a broader look at youth participation and its forms by the guiding question, how can we or how can it be supported even more? So therefore, we invited two guest speakers, Kari Sari and Natalia Wächter, and they will add their valuable contributions from their research findings and participation to this dialogue. You will hear more about the speakers in a moment. Uh, the dialogue will be moderated, as always, by Domi Kilakowski, and digital facilitation is done by Doma Moric. Thank you for joining, and you can check out our Ray website and our Ray social media pages for any further updates regarding this online series, and also save the date already for our next youth research dialogue on the 14th of December, where, uh, where we talk about um, innovation in European youth work and youth policy. So enjoy, and now to you, Tommy. Thank you, Carmen. <clears throat> Hello to everyone. My name is Tomi Kielakoski, and I will be the moderator of today's dialogue. You are warmly welcome to our discussion. The topic of today's, today's dialogue is participation. And participation has always been a really up-to-date theme. But perhaps more than ever, it is really up-to-date now. Researchers of public policies talk about participatory turn, meaning that there's a change happening the way, in the way we organize our public services. Most of the public services providers are trying to hear citizens better, and they feel the pressure to secure that decisions are increasingly more made with the citizens themselves. However, participatory return has also been criticized for not being inclusive enough and for trying to stick to the old ways of administ administration in the age of digital media. Now, for us in the youth field, of course, emphasis on participation is nothing new. And I want to quote a landmark of European youth policy, which was published almost 20 years ago today in November 2001, uh, mainly uh, New Impetus for European Youth, a white paper on youth policy, which is a landmark on, in the youth, youth policy of European Union. Now, now the paper heavily emphasized partic participation, and it stated that there is no democracy without participation. And uh, that paper already noted that young people are active in promoting democracy but they do not necessarily engage with society through representative democracy. 
So uh, new ways of making an impact, they're already visible 20 years ago. And people who were doing youth policy thought that they need to take that into account. And the paper said this, this by no means implies that young people are not interested in public life. Most show a clear will to participate and to influence the choices made by society, but they wish to do so on a more individual and more one-off basis outside of the old participatory structures and mechanisms. So this is what the white paper stated. That was 20 years ago, and in recent years, we have seen at least two really important developments. Uh, firstly, there has been a significant rise of the social media, which has recreated the public debate and has influenced the way we talk about politics and talk about participation and talk about citizenship even. And at least since uh, 2018 and the publication of the so-called uh, 1.5 degree report, the IPCC report, which demonstrated the need for urgent U-turn of our current practices, uh, the new climate movement of the young has sought to influence politics by combining different political styles. So today, today we will be discussing what we know about how different young people participate, what the new climate movement seeks to achieve, and how the European youth projects contribute to promoting participation of the young. And the big question behind all of this is how can youth participation be supported even more? Uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that our dialogue will be recorded and the live stream will be still will be available afterwards. And those of you at the audience, please comment on the discussion and ask questions. You can ask your questions on, on Facebook chat or on Mentimeter, and the code is displayed, is displayed on the screen at the moment. So without further ado, our first speaker today is Dr. Karisari, who works as a researcher in Uvenia, which is a youth research and development center in Southeastern University of Applied Sciences in Finland. His research interests have focused on youth studies, uh, civic activism, social movement, movement, ethnic relations, citizenship, and the relations between the police and citizens. Harry, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank for invitation to participate in this discussion session. And um, Dom, could you please Put the first slide, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, my theme today is to look um, whether um, or not to some kind of statement about youth passivism or passivity as a political actors in societies, some kind of myth, fact, or methodological, methodological, methodological dilemma or something uh, uh, focusing on these different aspects. Or something else. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I was participating a few years ago in a wide uh, European research project, My Place. Uh, acronym comes from words uh, memory, youth, political legacy, and civic, civic engagement. And um, there was um, 14 countries participating in this research project, and the, re re the research was conducted in uh, 30 different um, research sites in around to Europe, and over seventy thousand young people were participating uh, in surveys, in uh, um, qualitative interviews, and ethnographic research resources or studies um, in in under this project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what was found in European level in this this uh, research? N nothing new in this sense that, for example, the survey, survey which was done in these 13 locations indicated that youth activity have a move uh, from traditional institutional forms uh, more towards non-conventional activities, protest activities, uh, indiv individual forms of, of engagements, and so forth. And, uh, and uh, almost ha over half of total participation in political actions in this um, um, study was focusing in this non-conventional -con activities. Okay, next slide, please. What was the case in Finland? In Finland, uh, young people were and were not interested in politics and political parties. It was actually 50-50. Uh, half of them were interested, said that they were interested in 
this, these issues, uh, half of them didn't. What young people were participating actively was voting, uh, internet-related activism, signing petitions, 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 and political and ethical consumerism. So these kind of individual, independent forms of participation were very popular among some Finnish young people as well. But the young people also understood the meaning of political and parties as well as participation in very narrow sense. Um, actually, they connotated it quite strictly, I mean political, to uh, party politics and represent, representative uh, forms of political uh, activities. So, uh, in, in this sense, it was also that half of them were not interested in can be criticized that actually when we talk that what young people were interested in, they had a lot of interest, but they didn't perceive it many times as political. And Finnish young people, they represented average level of participation in, in general in these European my place countries. Okay, next slide, please. Um, are young people active or passive? Actually, this study also in Finland demonstrated that actually it's more complicated issue. Active in or passive in what what kind of forms of participation? For example, in this my my place survey in Finland, we clustered um, according to over twenty um, participation activities and also different kind of organizations, different kind of uh, types of participation, and. Uh, these five, from smallest to large, largest one, were non-political organization activists, light activists, inactives, formal activists, and lifestyle multi-activists. So it's more comp complicated picture that some might be focused on certain forms of activities, some might be quite generally passive people, some might be um, be active in multiple multiple spheres of political activism. Uh, just to mention, for example, these lifestyle activists, uh, lifestyle, lifestyle multi-activists, uh, generally uh, women, high educated people and uh, people from with middle, mid, mid, middle or upper class background were very general in this category. So there was also differences according, according to socio, socio demographic backgrounds. Uh, uh, inside these uh, or between these categories. Okay, next slide, please. And the slides, last slide. Um, we also made uh, with Airi Alin Alaste a comparison between these uh, these data sets in Estonia and Finland. And um, we were looking Estonia and Finland to societies with totally different kind of historical background, and also there was differences. Uh, in terms of young people's trust in political and social social instit institutions and also trust in democracy. But I don't go to, in, in at this point too much details about this activism. You can see that differences between the countries were that Finland in Finland in general, the young people were more active in different different types of different types of political activism. But what is important to notice also that there is huge differences between the research sites inside these two countries. So we many times we talk about passivity or activity in different in certain countries of young people, but we have also remembered that there might be huge heterogeneity amongst these young people, depending on. Uh, uh, socio-economic background, location where young people live, gender issues, gender, gender or age, age group or certain other, other features that are connecting to these young people. So, young people are not the same. Uh, that is the key point I tried to say today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kari, for drawing our attention to the 
to the diversity of youth participation. Our next speaker, Natalia Wetter, is a professor in social pedagogy at the University of Graz in Austria. Her research focuses on generations, youth and young adults, digitalization and social inequalities, identity, migration, as well as on international quantitative and qualitative studies. She will talk about self-conceptions of young activists in the Fridays for Future movement. The stage is yours, uh, Natalie. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and to share my research and to further discuss participation of young people. Can you please show the slide? Thank you. you don't have to say it's like automatically. Okay. Um, connecting very good to Kari's presentation, I will talk about uh, unconventional, unconventional uh, activism, uh, part political participation of young people in the Fridays for Future movement. And um, I will have a look at the self-conceptions of young active of the young activists and uh, if they are actors or rather victims um, in the ways they consider themselves. Next slide, please. Our research is ba based on the theory on the theory on the theory which understands young people as actors of social change. This means uh, that we understand young people not only um, as kind of victims, like affected by structural conditions, um, but also uh, we also understand them as sometimes very powerful actors, as actors that contribute also to social change. Uh, on the picture you see here, the, the young woman has written on her hand, our future on your, our future, like the young people's future in your hands, like in the adults and um, politicians hands. Uh, so it seems like this is more like a passive uh, conception. And I will further ask, please next slide, if this really is the case and uh, the research questions are with self conceptions, have young activists uh, about the uh, Fridays for Future movement and like between the two poles, do they see them as victims of the older generations and their politics or as actors of social and political change? For answering the research question, we did uh, qualitative research in Austria and Germany and we did qualitative interviews with uh, young Fridays for Future activists. Next slide, please. And here are the results. We found basically there are three main conceptions they have. So the first one is that they really emphasize individual responsibility. They say that they have changed their own lifestyle, which means, for example, uh, no, not driving, not having a car, not using flights, uh, little or some even to no consumption, little reduce consumption as much as possible, reduce energy use as much as possible. But um, they also say that um, to in order to prevent climate change, the political measures are also necessary. Individual responsibility is not is not enough, and. Um, so this is the second conception. They say that um, their engagement um, is, is necessary for putting pressure on politics to develop uh, measures. Um, because they think individuals, what individuals can do is important, but it's not enough to stop uh, climate change. And uh, but interestingly, there's also a third con conception which, say, which says um, that they, through their own engagement, like joining the demonstrations, they also want to increase the awareness among the whole population because they think political measures will only be implemented um, when the, the, the population is more or less ready for it. If, uh, so they also think that they, they see themselves as role models for um, mobilizing others and for um, um, mobilizing also or for creating awareness for um, political measures in in the whole population. And here I've uh, brought two examples. 
from the interviews. One example is from Austria, one is uh, from Germany. And um, so the first activist says, I found more and more that the individual approach, like if we all drive a car less often, then everything will be right again, is total bullshit, sadly, and that we need large scale political measures. And in a similar way, the second, in the second interview, the activist say, you can change a lot individually, but I believe that the real change has to come from politics. The politics has to make laws which prevent environmental pollution, which prevent the climate crisis, and that politics has to enforce change because otherwise it is happening much too slow. Okay, this was it. I hope for um, many, uh, for your questions and, uh, and for a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Natalia said that you can ask questions, but please do so on Menti and on Facebook. Our third speaker today is Helmut uh, Fennes, who has worked for the Ray Network since its foundation in 2008. Helmut has been involved in numerous Ray research projects, and he is also a founding member of the Austrian Network for Youth Research. He will be providing insights into how European youth programs foster the development, development of participation and citizenship practice. Go ahead, Helmut. Hello there. Um, I don't see the slides. Yes, here it is. <laughs> okay. Hello there. Um, I will talk about uh, findings of the Ray Network. Um, the Ray Network consisting of 32 or more 35 partners all over Europe in 34 countries or something. And having done research on the European youth programs, in particular on the Erasmus Plus Youth in Action, and uh, and uh, later lately on the European Solidarity Corps. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to start out with uh, the fact that fostering participation and citizenship is a main objective of European youth programs. And therefore, next line, it is obvious that Ray, the research-based analysis of European youth program, uh, explores effects of these programs on participation and citizenship, which it does, which it has been doing, uh, using a variety of research methods uh, since uh, its beginning in 2009, 2008, 2009. And uh, these research methods uh, include, on one hand, ex post surveys, where participants are asked about what they think uh, was the effect of the, pro of the project they participated in. So it is a very subject subjective measurement. Uh, therefore, we did a specific um, study in 2015 to 2018 uh, which um, was, it was a long longitudinal study, um, a panel study where a series of surveys tried to measure what actually the changes were. And that uh, included not only surveys, but also interviews and also in the control group. So it was possible actually in some way to measure the effects. And finally, we did a, a study just the last two years uh, with case studies of European projects uh, that were funded by European youth programs uh, in order to find out what works. So which methods, approaches are effective in uh, supporting, uh, fostering uh, participation and citizenship. Um, the Ray research from all these uh, studies shows that, in fact, uh, European youth programs foster participation and citizenship competence and practice. So the, the development of competence and the actual ac actions, so to say, the set. Uh, uh, one thing which needs to be said that there are different effects for different subgroups of participants. So not everyone learns everything. So some learn something and others learn something different. Uh, and some don't learn anything also. That's also happening. Uh, another, in this line, actually, it is worth mentioning that uh, the, those who have a higher educational achievement learn more 
or develop more competences and more practices than the average. So the messy effect also is effective in non-formal education, which is not new, but it is shown again here. But, and this is interesting, on the other hand, those who are less experienced, who had not these non-formal education opportunities also in the past, also learn more uh, uh, about participating in civil society and public life. Um, what needs to be mentioned also is that this learning takes place rather with respect to participation or general participation in civil society than in politic with respect to political participation. Maybe it, still in non-conventional political participation, um, you know, being encouraged to, to signing petitions, etc., but not much at all with respect to voting or running for office or being active as a politician. Next slide, please. So the question was uh, of the last project we did was what works? So what kind of project designs of methodologies of methods are effective uh, to foster participation and citizenship through these projects? The main essence, so to say, is walk the talk, okay? Uh, what, what really works is if young people practice participation and citizenship in funded projects, either through a real life experience, a real life participation project, so a, a real thing, or also through simulations. Next to that, um, it is essential, of course, and it's obvious, but one has to mention it again, to link these projects to current social and political events. So it is something that is really of, of concern at that, that time and point where the project takes place and maybe even in the immediate environment of the project, not something abstract that is maybe far away. Thirdly, what is essential and that is not completely new is that it requires uh, a combination of a variety of non-formal learning methods. Uh, it's not one specific method that is best suited to, to develop participation and citizenship competence and practice, but it's a combination of them. And of course, the more interactive ones. So discussions, role plays, field exercises, artistic methods, etc. cetera. Um, what is also essential, and that is also normal for non-formal education and learning, or for any educational process, is the reflection of what was experienced and learned during the project. So it becomes more than an experience, but it is actually the part of the learning that takes place is the reflection of it. Um, what is also working out to be effective is follow-up activities ordered by project participants. So they actually do their own thing uh, alone, what they have learned in the project projects in a rather protected environment. And so actually this becomes sustainable and has a multiplying effect. Um, last not least, that, that is evident, but it, it's often forgotten that it needs to apply principles of non-formal education and learning in these projects so they really become effective. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Fascinating presentation. There's a lot food for thought. I would like to pose first question to Helmut. Natalie talked about the Fridays for Future campaign, which is critical towards, towards society. It wants to put pressure, pressure on society. It's what, it wants to influence politics, and it calls for renewing our ecologically harmful way of life. In your opinion, what can European programs learn from the environmental movement of a young? And how should European programs respond to this movement? Uh, on one hand, I could say uh, this, what Natalie said, is actually confirming what we found out in our research as well. Uh, actually, in the projects, uh, a, a, a topic that is popping up increasingly or has been there during our studies uh, of the last five years uh, is, is projects encouraging young people to get involved in ecological issues okay so the projects actually work in that respect although this is not a specific well it even was somewhere in the program guide maybe yes but 
uh, uh, and very often it's projects that are not primarily aimed at fostering um, uh, activism in the field of ecology or, or sustainable development, uh, but it happens. So they actually uh, learn something about it and do something about it as well in the practice. So that works. But on the other hand, yes, uh, this is the, the glass is half full. Uh, uh, it's half empty, actually, <laughs> uh, but it could also be full. And I think uh, a lesson to be learned is to make um, climate change and actions against climate change as a as a as a top, a top uh, agenda of as an, a priority of European youth projects. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think this is a unique situation we're in now. The next ten years will more or less decide on the survival of humankind in some way. Okay, or for many at least. And so uh, this requires action. And if the European Union is doing the big, great uh, green deal, then this is the program that could be an instrument actually to, to create activism like Fridays for Future, but also other, other facets of it. So not only in the streets, but in everyday life. Uh, so I would say this, this would be my suggestion, what could be done. Thank you, Helmut. <clears throat> So, Natalie, uh, there's a question for you from the audience, so we'll take that. Do you want to comment on what Helmut said? And while you think about it, I just ask a question, so if you want to, you can take the two questions simultaneously. So there's a question about role models. Uh, did the Fridays for Future activists talk about the need for role models or figureheads like Red Thunberg in getting people to be active? Uh, you're unmuted, Natalia. So, uh, with the first question, with what I say about what Helmut said, right? And um, I, yeah, I, I totally agree. We know that uh, young people are motivated to participate um, if uh, it's a, a topic they're concerned with. If it's uh, and uh, now, very obviously, it's uh, the. It's the climate change. Um, and uh, so even if, uh, if, we, if we do not agree with them, it's a very good chance, if, uh, if we wouldn't agree with them, it's a very good chance to say, okay, now they, it's very clear what they're interested in. Let's use it for European politics and let's make them, uh, yeah, let's take the chance so that then uh, that they can more participate. So yes, I uh, agree with what Helmut said. And um, about the what was the question about the role models? Did young people talk about the need for role models, such as Greta Thunberg, in uh, hmm. in supporting young people and in making well, them active? They, um, we did not explicitly ask them for it, but it did not seem to be important. They don't really. Uh, it's like there are some role models or important persons <laughs> kind of in the movement but, uh, and i think they would say very important in the beginning for initializing uh, the protest but now it has become big and uh, and it's uh, they see themselves like it's more like each act activist sees themselves as role models for others who are not participating in the movement yet and as role models, also for like the individual lifestyle, they see themselves like as role models, so that they have to um, um, live a sustainable lifestyle and to show others how to do it. Thank you, Natalia. There's a question for Kari. Firstly, uh, I'd like you to comment on what Natalia and, and Helmut said earlier. How do you listen to this? How do you look at the results and, and opinions and interpretations as a scholar of political participation? So that's the first one. And then there's a second one about, about the use of research in, in youth policy. So did the Estonian National Agency react to this research of the young people in their country? And in your, opinion, in your presentation, you, you noted that mm. not all the Estonians are as active as, as Finns. Yeah. So did, 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 did the DNA react to this? I could start with this Estonian case. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I, I, I haven't um, actually. Iri Alina Alaste would be better, <laughs> a better person to answer this more more closely. But I, I, I'm quite sure that it's not a huge, 
huge uh, news in that sense in in Estonia because there's also between these two countries there is in general there's differences in civic participation so it's actually this youth uh, lower lower level of participation in Estonia it's it's not a big news in that sense that 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 uh, there's there's because it's it's fitting to some kind of picture that what is what is the level of participation in social movements and and non political organizations and so forth so um but what I, but, I, but it's it's good to say uh, in diplomatic way that i don't know exactly what is the discussion in Est estonia estonia in, in this so, so it's better not <laughs> to go to, to do deep on that but, but but my 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 interpretation is that it's, it's not so huge issue because in general in finland this participation in civic activities is in a higher level and uh, uh about these programs mm, i don't know um i was thinking of before be, beforehand uh, it that um that uh I think this 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 kind of uh, connecting them to the group, what is go, going on right now, now in in a society. I think that that it sounds good idea in that sense that because many times the poly, this kind of division that what is happening in the lives of young people and what is uh, happening in the political world, uh, there's a, a division between these two realities and and there's this connection of young people's life and their experiences and their uh interest interest in social social issues when when they actually po something political going on and and participation is focusing on those those it's i i, I can understand it's, it's something that which which somehow can diminish this kind of uh wall between political uh um political activity in that sense that for, for example in finland finland uh it was that for many young people this this they perceive that there's that that politi politician political activism is very elitistic uh, um, sphere of human life <laughs> you if i are put it in simple way that somehow that i'm not too clever or too uh, motivated or too i don't have enough skills to participate many young people have they they, they are a little bit scary that what that, that I, I'm not too enough competent to participate, and I, th I think this is also what is also created already in a school system. In that sense, that that somehow um, in this dem school democracy is based on represent pre representation, which is basic democratic way of doing. But this kind of other other kind of civil participation is it's it's not seen as as an important in school that 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 how that it's enough that one student is representing the others and their ideas but but it's, it's focusing on individuals that somehow people easily learn that i'm not i'm not my uh, my voice um, is not heard or uh, um, uh, and and i i'm, I'm not I don't have enough skills to participate. So yeah, thank you, Kari. Helmut and Kari pointed out different ways of uh, of making making participation more genuine. Uh, I have a question for Natalie. Uh, Helmut talked about the importance of linking current social and political events to the projects, and that way we can create genuine participation. One of my favorite quotes on participation is one by Mary John. She says that participation without influence is mere window dressing. So do, uh, do you want to add something? Uh, participation without influence is a mere window dressing. Uh, okay. It's just yeah. decorating, decorating mm -hmm. the outerior, but not changing what's, what's what is going on inside. So do you want to add something? What are your ideas how we can uh, achieve genuine participation? Uh, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> um, let me let me think. I mean, we um, as Kari said already. Um, like we have to probably work on on well, there's it's two things. It's how can we how can we get people to participate, and um, how can we make sure that if they participate, um, they will also be heard, and they mm -hmm. that they will also 
you know, it will really make an, an impact, you have an impact on politics. So um, I could say a lot about the first question, but you asked me more about the second one. So how, how can we make sure it really, uh, it's not just an exercise for young people, but that they really, that there's an outcome. And um, so um, I, I don't, I only have vague ideas about that. But uh, for example, I would think that uh, it could be an idea to have youth representatives in existing political parties in uh, traditional uh, politics also. So they could, they could also be in, in social movements uh, at the same time, but uh, because as we know now, in, in uh, also in Europe, like the, the average politician is um, older. <laughs> and uh, so if you have, especially like in, in, in smaller communities, you could have uh, a young person representing the younger population. And if you have that uh, throughout uh, a whole country, uh, that could make we it would would be worth a try, right? <laughs> to um, to see uh, if uh, uh, if that would work and if it would make a change. At the same time, though, I have to say it's important that there is also um, that people young people learn about political participation, that they become encouraged. Uh, to express, to find out what are their needs at all. How they can they be can they express their needs and uh, and uh, so it's uh, yeah it's we have to work on still it's a long it's a topic that has been discussed for many many years but we still for decades even I would say but we still have to work on several levels um, to encourage people empower them them for participation then um, to uh, then to make sure that they can express also their needs. They have to learn participation. As Kari said, uh, the school system is not, it's, yeah, there's like usually a represent, uh, one representative who's representing uh, the other pupils, but, uh, and that's it, but it's not that each person is encouraged to, to, um, to participate really. And the third level then is if they're really, uh, going if they really if young people are ready to participate to express their opinion if they have uh, topics as now they have with the ecological movement then uh, it's uh, up to us of thinking of really of ways how to um, um, implement their voices into politics and uh, one of them is uh, to really have also youth uh, uh, young people representing themselves in political bodies Thanks to all of you. <clears throat> you make participation sound at, at the same time really easy and really difficult. Pay attention to what young people are doing, what do they want, what do they, what do they talk about, use different methodologies. But then there are these you know, structural issues. And of course, it's a question about, about how, how to keep our democracy alive. Uh, There's a question from the audience, and this goes to any one of you, I guess, who is able to answer this. Uh, did the research projects you talk about, did they find evidence on the influence of the young people's biographies, their life ex experiences on their subjective way of participation? So how do their life experiences affect the way they want to participate and influence society? I know I just talked a lot, <laughs> but uh, I can definitely uh, say something about about this topic, yes, uh, we what we can see also, uh, and which I should have added um, um, in my earlier statement, is that only young people who are uh, have, have a chance to participate also in other areas of life, like if uh, they are participating in the labor market, in leisure activities, and so and so on. Only then they are also able to participate in a political way. So, and we also, I just uh, a few <clears> days ago at the conference, uh, I was at the conference uh, for the Society for Research of Young Adults, Emerging Adults, it's called, well, it's the same. And, um, and there was a presentation on the, the connection between well being and uh, political participation of 
young people of young adults and uh, and it's it, it's strongly connected so those who are correlated so those who are, um, are have more well-being they're also more likely to participate because uh, if you have other problems it's and it, you don't believe in the society if you're not if you do not feel yourself being part of the society uh, you're not gonna politically participate so Helmut, do you want to answer this this question yeah. Yes, big question. And uh, of course, one has to be aware that young people participate in such a project, which is maybe an account of one week or two weeks or something like that, except for the voluntary service, there can be much longer. And and what do you expect that this is a life changing experience? Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we found in our research that these activities, these special projects, so to say, are eye openers. And, and that they become aware of something they were not aware before. So because they were exposed to a different setting and whatsoever, and so they wouldn't maybe say this has changed my life. This is what we would wish they would say, but uh, it has an effect, okay? It's not maybe measurable in a, in, in, to a large degree, but uh, yes, people do something different in, as a result from such an activity whatever it is now, some kind of engagement, something emotional. Uh, that's the important part about this. It's not something that's happening in your head, but it's happening in your heart and in your belly. And, and I think that makes people then reconstruct. And then they actually do something different afterwards, take other paths. But you never know if it's different from what they would have done anyway. You know, kind of, it's, it's speculation. Huh? <laughs> but at least they say this, uh, this, uh, I, I'm doing now something differently than before. Yes, uh, I'm really glad that you brought up the topic of emotions and the importance of talking about talking about not only rational things, influencing society, dialogue, and those sort of things, because you know that's that's really important. Feeling accepted, even negative feelings such as anger, might be might, might be important. So please continue, Helmut. Yeah, I want to say something because it was brought up before and it was about schools uh, mm -hmm. and, and what kind of what is participation in schools. And I would I would be very skeptical about that. Uh, from my experience and point of view, schools are not democratic institutions mm -hmm. per se in, in themselves. They are hierarchical, they are authoritarian. And what is happening in schools is decided by people who are not in that school. So there's very little influence uh, within a school what, what, what they can actually shape themselves. And it's normally minor things they can shape. And, and maybe just arranging kind of uh, when does it start and end or something like that. Uh, is it starting at 8 or at 8.15? Um, and, and therefore, I think uh, that youth work per se has an enormous role there because because if in school you establish participation, it's a top-down approach and it doesn't work, okay? Mm -hmm. If it comes from inside, it becomes a revolution and young people are at risk when they start a revolution in school, okay? They must uh, fear that uh, their, their their action is actually not welcomed or rather the opposite and they will be punished in some way because it's not a democratic system. And, and therefore, youth work is the big opportunity, I think, because there it's not something you impose on young people, but actually the, the, the role of youth work is to empower young people. Yeah? And not to train them to do something, but help them so they can do what they want to do and develop their spaces or even occupy their spaces of participation. Okay? That can happen in youth work. It cannot happen in school. Therefore, I would put my efforts in with, return, with respect to citizenship, education and learning more in the out of school area than in school area. Although learning about political history and political systems, all, the, all that is important too. But that is not really the interesting part about it. I think the, the, the interesting part is about becoming engaged in what is going on around you. And that, I think, is a big motivation. You just have to learn how to do it, uh, but not say, here is your space where you can do what you want to do. No, they have to find it themselves and have to occupy it and take it themselves. And our, the, the difficult role is, what do you do as a youth worker uh, or in, active in the youth field to make that happen? Uh, 
I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question, and it's a good way to stop. I mean, <laughs> Natalia said that, you know, they have talked about participation for 20 years, and we will conti continue to do so for 20 <laughs> years more. And our dialogue was perhaps an example of this. So they ran out of time, not out of topics or fascinating yeah. ideas. So uh, there are so many things I would love to talk talk to talk to you talk to you about, but we have to call it quits. In case anyone in the audience wants to ask questions, you can post them on Facebook or on Menti, and we will answer them afterwards. So uh, big thanks to all of you, Natalia, Helmut, and Kari for your contribution, and thanks for everyone at the audience. So this was our third Ray Youth Research Dialogue. We would also like to invite you to our last Youth Research Dialogue this year, which will happen on 14th of December. It will focus on innovation in European youth work and youth policy. Please check out Ray website for more information and the social media pages for up updates. We wel welcome you to join us again when we are discussing new youth research and youth policy issues. Take care. Mm -hmm.